Does your website need more traffic? Well, visit overflowcafe.com today. They make websites popular and over 41,000 people use their service to gain more customers. They are winning our business. What about you? Visit overflowcafe.com today. Welcome to Rockefeller's Barbershop. This is the day that the Lord has made, and I will be blessed and be glad in Him. Today I want to introduce myself. My name is Rico Rodriguez at Rockefeller's Barbershop here in San Antonio, Texas, 1733 Babcock Road. My phone number is 210-782-5188. Come out and get your haircut here at Rockefeller's Barbershop. You are listening to I Am Refocused Podcast on iHeartRadio. You are listening to I Am Refocus Podcast Special Edition with your host, Shamaya Reed. This podcast is designed to inspire you to live your purpose and regain your focus. Now, let's tune in into today's podcast. This is I Am Refocus Podcast, and today we have an awesome show lined up for y'all. Right before we get to the show, I want to thank our sponsors. And top of the list, I want to thank Mr. Rico Rodriguez of the Rockefeller's Barbershop. If you're in San Antonio, Texas, or you're going to be in San Antonio, Texas soon, make sure you stop by 1733 Babcock Road, San Antonio, Texas, and get an awesome haircut with Rico Rodriguez. I also miss Kim of River City Donuts. You can get the best donuts here in San Antonio and Mr. Baby McClinton of All Sports Speed and Conditioning. He has trained a lot of NFL and NBA players. You can check out his website at allsportsfitness.net. And also, big shout out to the D.W. Brooks Funeral Home and overflowcafe.com. Is your website in here some traffic? Well, if you want some of the best traffic in the world, you need to head over to overflowcafe.com. Last but not least, I want to give a special shout out to beyondbeanie.com. Beyondbeanie.com, they sell bracelets and beanies. And for every sale, they donate 10% to feed kids and also provide dental care for kids in need. If you want to use my code to get 25% off of all purchases, you can use READ25, that's R-E-E-D, 25. And that code will allow you to have 25% off. Now to today's show. Today's show, we have Abraham Azriali. And this is an awesome individual who is an author. How are you doing today, sir? Doing well. Thanks for having me. So today we are going to be talking about your book, Deborah Calling. I want to ask you right off the bat, what is Deborah Calling about? Deborah Calling is a a second novel in a uh, series I'm writing uh, for uh, the publishing house Harper's Collins. Mm -hmm. And it features really the first woman we know of uh, to lead a nation in history. Um, She's known uh, as Deborah, uh, and uh, in the Bible, she's known as Deborah the prophet or the prophetess. Uh, She was a judge and then um, a military leader and the religious leader of the ancient Israelites. What I'm writing is a fiction um, series, but it's based on her life and the history of that time. And how did that story in the Bible, how did it grab your interest? It's a fascinating little tidbits in um, uh, the book of Judges. Uh, there is a very um, short, relatively short story about a woman named Deborah who appears as an adult. There is no information about her childhood or her ancestry or family. Uh, she appears in, as an adult. And uh, the story says, well, at that time, uh, Deborah was a judge and uh, the mother of Israel. And she goes on to uh, fight a liberation war against the Canaanites, who at the time were controlling uh, and oppressing the Israelites, and wins that war together with her uh, chief of the military, uh, a man named Barak uh, ben Avinoam, son of Avinoam. And um, he, uh, other than sharing a name with our uh, last president, Barak, uh, he was um, her deputy. 
So this is a very unusual story in the Bible, a woman who is not only a judge and a prophet, but also a military leader. Made me very curious, um, how could a woman at that time, when men controlled everything, and women were not much more than than slaves and and, um, livestock almost, um, how could a woman rise to that kind of a powerful position? It's a very curious riddle. And um, my story tries to solve that by presenting her, you know, adventurous youth, as I imagine it. And how does the story of Deborah, how is it relevant to our time in modern society? That's a fascinating aspect of this story, because today's world um, is, is a very diverse in terms of how women are being treated. We live in, in um, you know, in the U.S., at least I live in the U.S., and here women have freedom and equality uh, to a large extent, not not completely. There are still areas in which women um, are not um, offered the same opportunities as men, but they're free. Uh, the interesting thing and, and the sad thing is that large parts of the world are still stuck in, in biblical time where women have no rights or very little rights. They're oppressed. They're uh, sold and bought um, just as livestock. If you look at parts of, um, you know, most parts of the Middle East, um, large parts of Africa, even in the Far East, uh, women have very little rights. So what's interesting is that some parts of the world, the Western world, we have tremendous changes. And some parts of the world are not very different than the times of, of uh, Deborah in uh, in biblical times about 3,200 years ago. What was the most surprising thing that you learned while you were writing this book? You know, the more research I, I was doing, uh, the more I learned how people in ancient time were very similar to us. And it's it's hard to grasp at first because we have, you know, iPhones and cars and planes. Uh, you know, life is very different today in terms of technology. Mm-hmm. But the people themselves, if you read, not only read the Bible, but also read the great archaeological books that I've been reading since I started working on this uh, series, you discover that people um, had the same passions, the same feelings to a large extent, and and even though they didn't have the technology necessarily, they did have luxury. And there was a class system similar to today. There were people who were very rich. They lived in palaces. They had, you know, servants and slaves. And there were the masses of, of poor people who were basically struggling to survive. And you see a lot of this in archaeological digs that unearth um, you know, the physical remnants of uh, ancient life. What was the hardest scene that you had to write while using the process? Well, the the beginning of the first book in the series, which is uh, titled Deborah Rising, mm-hmm. starts with um, a stoning in which a young woman, in today's world, we'll, we would call her a girl. She was, you know, 14 years old, uh, but in the story, she's married as as um, women were married, you know, at 13 usually, and uh, she, there is a, a trial and a stoning based on a false accusation uh, of, um, you know, sexual impropriety, mm-hmm. and, and that was very, very hard to write. Um, first of all, I, I myself have a daughter, and, and the whole set of set of uh, facts that lead to a stoning in um, and there's a lot of records of stonings in ancient times by the way it's it's a terrible way to to kill a person if there is a difference it's 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 very cruel and very painful and humiliating uh, so that was very hard to write and there were other scenes of course where you know injustice mm-hmm. is a very hard thing to write But you need to write it if you want to be true to what history was like. And for the opposite feeling of that previous question, what then was the more enjoyable part for you to write in this book? Yeah. You know, what I find really fascinating is 
to apply the feelings of people today to my characters who were, you know, in this um, historical series about Deborah lived, you know, more than 3,000 years ago. And what I discovered through writing is that um, people have similar um, emotions. There was, you know, passion and and hate, uh, greed and generosity, uh, feeling, you know, those who feel a passion for justice and those who are, you know, selfish and, and abusive. And you see that people have very similar motivations, you know, greed, generosity, envy, love. I do think that people experience very similar feelings to what we experience today, even though they lived in, in a much more primitive um, surrounding and had to struggle for existence a lot more than most people in the modern world. How did you keep the intensity of the plot throughout the whole novel? There was a, a wonderful writer who passed away recently named Elmer Leonard, and he uh, he had this uh, principle. He, he said that he just skips the boring parts when he writes his books. And, and um, as a reader, when I read um, fiction and I uh, fiction or nonfiction, and I find myself skipping parts, I tell myself that when I write my books, I should not include any parts that people will skip. <laughs> so yeah. that, that's the first principle that I follow. Um, I like to um, entertain my readers and expose them to a, a wonderful, you know, historical setting and, and wonderful people and characters are very interesting and do interesting things. And the, and the key to that, I think, is to tell them what happens. I tell my readers the exciting things that happen, the conflicts, the adventures, the confrontations, and also the internal thoughts of the character when, when, they're, when they're relevant and when they're interesting. And people like to know what the characters think. That's the wonderful thing about a novel. But I do try to skip the boring stuff and, and move the story um, relatively quickly while giving people enough time to comprehend where the character is and, and identify with the character. At any moment, did you ever find yourself coming outside of your comfort zone as far as writing? I think one of the most difficult things to write about is, is um, uh, sexual situations. Mm -hmm. and, and my books are not explicit because I'm, I know that the readers, some of them are young, uh, some of my readers you know, are young you know, teenagers. Uh, so I don't write explicit stuff, but I, I do have to bring enough of it so people know, so the readers know what's happening. Um, that's always difficult. It's difficult for every writer, I think, unless you, you take kind of a pervert pleasure in it, which is really not my type of writing. But uh, that that's one area. And the other area is um, when you have uh, suffering, when your character is suffering or when your character is in a position that she has to inflict suffering on somebody else. It's, it's a fight. It's an ambush. Uh, it's a situation where she's fighting for her life. And unfortunately, um, life in, in biblical uh, ancient Israel involved a lot of fighting and a lot of suffering and a lot of conflict. And I need to be honest to the story and I do include it and I struggle with it sometimes to make sure that I present an exciting scene that is realistic and sometimes it's shocking and intense and that can that can be taxing on a writer. Um, absolutely. And with Deborah's story, as you're writing, what were some of your goals to to accomplish during the process? My, my most uh, intense and passionate uh, um, goal in this series is really to to do justice to this in, incredible woman uh, who is not very well uh, discussed in in. Um, neither in religious circle or in biblical circles, because, you know, the, the, the world of religion is mostly controlled by men, even today. Mm. The, the main religions are completely controlled by men. And therefore, uh, a woman like this, who is really unique in the, in the Bible, a woman who reached the top and became the, the leader, uh, is really not discussed very much. So my first goal, and I'm 
feeling pretty good about how it's coming about in the series is to show her for who she really was, in my opinion, uh, extraordinary uh, young woman who uh, suffered a lot and, and had to overcome tremendous uh, challenges and difficulties, which I believe um, really crystallized uh, her strengths and, um, and honed her skills and made her uh, resilient and strong to such an extreme that she was able to rise to the top of her nation and become the leader of the nation as a woman. So that's really my main passion in this uh, um, novel series. Uh, and uh, so far, I think it's, it's been going pretty well. And also with the Deborah Rising series, do you see in the near future any more novels coming out? Yes, in fact, I uh, I just submitted the third novel in the series to the publisher. So two novels are out, uh, Deborah Rising, which is the first novel, and Deborah Calling, which is a new novel that uh, came out recently. And I finished uh, the manuscript of the third and submitted it to the publisher, and there may be more Um it's it's a fascinating story, and, I, and I've been hearing wonderful things from readers. Readers send me uh, readers uh, send me emails and um, and uh, post uh, reviews on on different websites. Uh, so there is a very positive response from the readers, and um, I would love to to continue this um, you know relationship with my readers, and and it may very well be uh, continuing Deborah's stories through her rise to power. And where can people find the the series of of Deborah Rising? Well, both of the of the books, uh, Deborah Rising and Deborah Calling, are available on most um, um, outlets. Of course, on Amazon, both as paperback and ebook, uh, as well as on the Barnes and Noble outlets and um, uh, Google Play, um, on iTunes um, as an ebook, of course. Um, and in bookstores, um, if, if it's not on the shelf, it can be ordered uh, pretty much everywhere. And I want to touch in on your personal life. If you guys are now just tuning in, we are talking to Ezrieli, Mr. Ezrieli, first name, Abraham. So, sir, I, I read in your Bible that you grew up in Israel. Tell us how how was childhood like for you? I grew up in a fascinating time in Israel. I was born in 62 a uh, very difficult time in Israel, uh, very tiny borders um, and um, a lot of violence from um, the Arab nations around. Uh, but in 67, when I was um, about five years old, um, there was a, a large um, conflict called the Six Day War. Um, and um, Israel grew um, uh, after being attacked and, and um, being at great risk. Um, Israel uh, liberated a lot of uh, the ancient uh, territory of the of the ancient Hebrews. So that was a very fascinating time, which probably impacts my writing, because uh, Israel captured um, uh, Judea and Samaria, uh, which is now called the West Bank in political jargon. Uh, but uh, Judea and Samaria is really where the the um, stories of the Bible took place. There's a tremendous number of, of ancient um, Jewish sites. And uh, as a teenager, I, I used to hike a lot and visit a lot of places. And that was a fascinating time. Do you remember how old you were when you first were introduced to the Bible stories? Well, very early on. I, I grew up in a very traditional family. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and, and my mom was a school teacher. Uh, very uh, interested in the Bible, speaking about the stories of the Bible. Uh, I think uh, the Bible was not only a religious uh, um, source, but but it was viewed as a historical document hmm. that um, may not be you know accurate word by word historically, but f for the most part reflects um, the story of um, the people of Israel from very early on. Did anyone inspire you to write? And if anyone did, who? I was always a dedicated reader. I, I loved reading um, uh, fiction and nonfiction. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that I was inspired by, by other novels, all the novels that I've read as, as a young person. Um, um, Suspense, some of them Jewish writers, some of them not Jewish writers. 
uh, I, re- I read in Hebrew, actually. I grew up speaking and reading in Hebrew, and then uh, in my late teens started reading English, um, wonderful novels by um, uh, Frederick Forsyth and uh, Ira Levin and Ken Follett, um, more kind of historical suspense. Um, I think that's probably where the motivation comes from. Did you ever knew without doubt that you'd be an author of 12 books? No, no. I, I actually went to into law. I, I studied law in Israel and then I studied law again in, in New York at Columbia Law School and I practiced law for many years. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the, the writing, um, while I did start writing very early, you know, 25 years ago, uh, it slowly evolved from a hobby to my primary occupation. And what is it about writing that just really makes you enjoy the whole process from beginning to end? That's a complex question. Uh, I uh, I think it's it's um, it's a combination of factors. First of all, it's it's very creative. Um, you create a whole world in your head. Uh, which is a wonderful sense of freedom and and almost um, almost a sense of creation um, in in a divine sense, <laughs> which is I don't mean it in a, in a presumptuous way, but mm-hmm. you really create your own world and you create people and you then have them do things uh, within the realm of of um, uh, you know. Uh, authenticity or, or you want people, you want your readers to believe that these are real people with real issues, even though you create them. Mm. And uh, to do that, you have to, you have to make sure that your story is anchored in real events in real facts and has authenticity. So people can suspense disbelieve and enjoy the story. Uh, but it's a, it's a very interesting process. It involves structure. You have to, um, build a story, have the elements, have the the journey from beginning to end. That it has to make sense and it has to feel real. Uh, I, I enjoy it tremendously. And with our listeners, say there's authors out there, maybe they're working on our first book. What's some words of wisdom that you give to someone who's just starting out, you know, building their, their first book? I think the best advice I ever got was to write, just just write, uh, and and not to listen to too many advice um, from other people because it's a very personal thing. If there is a story you want to write, uh, can be also your life story, or it can be true events, or it can be your thoughts, um, either political or historical, whatever it is that people have passion for, if you have passion to write, just write. And the writing has a, a, its own um, energy and its own um, evolution. Writing becomes better the more you write. Uh, I think that's the best advice. If you want to write, write. Uh, once you feel that it's as good as you can ever make it, then you can show it to other people. And even then, you shouldn't listen to advice too much because it's such a personal form of art. I like that. And as a father and a husband, do they have a special book that that you wrote that they call their favorite or do they like all of them? <laughs> Oh, my, my kids, um, you know, the older one, I have four, and, and uh, the older two um, have read, uh, I think, most or all of my books. And um, I don't know if they have a favorite, but uh, they, they make fun of me for, for some of the stuff that I write, and um, they, they enjoy it, and they recommend it to their friends, which is really the best compliment. That's how I know that, uh, that they really enjoy it. Um, but uh, yes, they, they read my books and my wife, re- my wife is really the first reader. Uh, and, uh, she's a very good reader, very critical. She's herself uh, highly educated and, and insightful. Uh, so that's tremendous help. And yes, it's, it's a family enterprise in that respect. <laughs> I'd like to ask this question. This is a very popular question. We ask all of our guests, how do you define success for you? It's a very good question, uh, and it's a very individual question. For me, success is a process. I think um, you start with um, 
with the first goal. Uh, and that's something I learned from, uh, from running. I, I used to, to run um, long distance and I still try, though it's getting harder with age. But, um, and again, that's an advice that's good for writing as well is to set modest goals. And if you set them up modest goals, then that's a success. For me, success was to write a really good book. And it took me many, many years until I was happy uh, with my earlier books. And um, then, you know, if you're a normal person, you would have ambitions. You want to, you know, do better, um, succeed more, have more um, readers. Um, but I feel that every day that I write is a success. So in that respect, I, I feel blessed. I like that. There's also one thing in your Bible that was very interesting. You served as a intelligence officer. Can you tell us a little bit about that? That was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I was very young. In Israel, uh, there is a mandatory uh, military service when you finish high school at 18 uh, unlike here where you go to college or, or get a job in Israel you have to go into the army and you have to serve and, and I, I did my duty and uh, some of it was interesting some of it was um, kind of routine military work but uh, it was um, many years ago and um, I I, I feel blessed that I live in a country now that does not have mandatory uh, military service and, and uh, is a safe country. But in Israel, there is a tremendous um, um, existential risk continuously, uh, even today. So it was uh, it was a necessary thing, and, and I'm glad I did it, and I'm glad it's far behind me. <laughs> and with having the passion for writing, did you ever create a journal? by any chance or have a you know quiet time where you just wrote about life I don't I don't really write um, about myself no. some writers find it to be a wonderful outlet um, uh, a writer that I admire greatly is uh, Herman Wouk uh, W-O-U-K he wrote tremendous books um, and, and he still writes he's actually 101 years old uh, and he published uh, a new book last year um, which is incredible but he has uh, from what I've read he has uh, written a journal every day and he uh, believes it's a uh, it's a good thing to do. For me, it never been a need, and uh, I have never really kept a journal. So, no. And going a little bit back to the Bible, how has faith, if if it has, how has it impacted your journey? You know, I was raised in a very uh, devout family, and uh, I have since then um, I've gone to different places in terms of my view about faith and about religion and um, I think faith if you look at faith as the search for existential answers then then it's an, a necessary element for every uh, thinking person you always have those questions uh, Where? why are we here what is the purpose how we can live a good life what is the meaning of a good life and what happens next those are existential questions that that every religion tries to answer and there are probably hundreds if not thousands over the history of, of men and women uh, various answers and theories about it the way I look at it is part of making a story I think we each one of us have to make a story for ourselves of who we are and, and are we good or bad and, and where we're going. And in that respect, I think faith, uh, however you call it, uh, faith, religion, um, those are the answers that each one of us finds. And, and I'm no different than you and everybody else probably in that respect. That's a very well put answer. Well, how can people stay in contact with you? How can they support your work and find you on, on online 
Well, obviously, the the most um, wonderful feeling is when people buy my books and read them and, and reach out to me. Uh, the best way to reach out to me is through my website, which is my last name and the word books dot com. So it's uh, www.azrielibooks dot com. And um, my books obviously are available everywhere. And um, I love to hear from my readers. I, I actually hear a lot from readers uh, from all over the world. And that's the most wonderful aspect of, uh, of my profession. And um, I have tremendous ex- excitement for this series, Deborah Rising. I feel that it's tremendously meaningful for a lot of people. So, yeah, I would love to hear from uh, readers and they can reach me through my website. And before we close this program, we are talking to Abraham Azrieli. Sir, would you like to give anyone a shout out? Oh, um, for good people everywhere. That that's the best I can do. Yeah, I like that. I think uh, we live in a in a very troubled world. A lot of suffering around, a lot of injustice. Mm. And um, I'd like to give a shout to good people everywhere, especially to the kids who marched last weekend. Mm. I think the tremendous um, phenomena of, of passion. Uh, and I hope young people grow more and more passionate about making the world better. I think that was a wonderful example. And you really just hit something I, I can't leave without asking this. Say there's an individual who listens to this podcast and say they feel like they're stuck in life. What some words of encouragement would you give to someone to just move on so that they can continue to live their life and find their passion? You know, there are. I read a, a wonderful book called Grit, uh, G R I T. You know, grit, and and that that really is one of the things that's great about us as human beings. I think we have uh, a mind, and we can make decisions, and we can set goals. And um, you know, I I grew up in a country that spoke a different language, uh, and um, without financial means, I grew up very modestly, and I ended up in a in the United States, writing novels, uh, which was a very far-fetched um, uh, plan or or ambition. So I think, you know, try to uh, mark your uh, path and, and start taking one step at a time. I think people can reach very far if they put their mind to it. I love that answer. Well... There you guys have it. This was a awesome show. Make sure you go and support Abraham as reality and go get his book, Deborah Calling. And also get the whole series. Make sure you go to his website. His website is as reality books. That is A Z R I E L I B O O K S dot com. Thank you, sir, so much for being on our show. I appreciate Thank you for having me. Thank yes. you for having me and have a wonderful night. Yes, sir. And before we close this broadcast, like I say every time, keep God first, stay focused, and peace. <laughs>